come to your house and worship you and I pray that you'd help us to uh, be able to do that tonight be with us as we open your word and help it to touch our hearts tonight we ask it in Jesus name amen Lord I lift your name on high Lord I love to sing your Of my worship, flow to you, Lord. 
float here Let the rivers of my worship float here Lord, I pray in all I do Let the rivers of my worship float here Like streams in the valley Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the night, and Lord, we thank you for this time that we come together. Just lift up your name and song that we can spend this time praying together as a church tonight. Father, we pray for our youth and for our children as they meet this evening. Lord, you be with their leaders. You be with them as they go through their time of um, teaching, and uh, we pray for the students, Lord, that they would come to know more about you tonight. Father, you bless our time as we look at your word together, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 3 is our text. We're now looking at that third verse, and the message is entitled, The Necessity of the New Birth. John chapter 3 says, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In this verse here, we have a uh, recorded account of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. And he makes this statement to Nicodemus, and he says, You must be born again. Now what we have to understand here is Jesus is speaking about a spiritual birth and not a, a physical birth, but Jesus is saying that this spiritual birth is absolutely necessary if we're going to be a part of the spiritual life that he wants for us. Just as important as this spiritual birth to, to have a spiritual life, it's just as important as physical birth is to have a, a physical life. But this spiritual birth comes from God. No one can have a, a spiritual life without this new spiritual birth. It is essential. It is necessary. And without this new birth, Jesus tells Nicodemus that no one can even see the kingdom of God. He doesn't say that you can't enter it. We know that you can't enter it because Jesus said you can't even look at it. You're not even going to get a glimpse at the kingdom of God, and you're surely not going to live in the kingdom of God. It's necessary here for the soul to be born into the spiritual realm. There are a lot of people out there tonight that trust their morality for their salvation. They trust their education for their salvation, their, their cultural upbringing for their salvation, or maybe their good works and their generosity for their salvation. But when you trust in those things, Jesus is saying, you're disregarding my word. Because what Jesus tells Nicodemus here in John chapter 3 is, you must be born again, and the birth that he's talking about is not, work, is not a work of any man at all. It's not a work of a man, it's a work of God. We see here in our text tonight that for some people this can sort of be a, a, a confusing text when they look at, at John chapter 3. It's really not that confusing. There's some things that are really laid out for us that are very easy to see. And the first thing you see is the nature of this new birth is explained. He says in verse 3, except a man be born again. Now that, that, that term, be born again, in the Greek is a phrase that can also mean born from above. And what Jesus is saying, unless a man is born from above, this man cannot see the kingdom of heaven. This man will never experience salvation. You see, it's, it's this birth that is from God that gives a person, a man or a woman, boy or girl, gives them their spiritual life. 
and it comes from God, and it's a spiritual life that, is, that can only be fed into the soul by God himself. This new birth is this uh, divine nature that's imparted from the Father. It's received by the human heart. And we see in John chapter 6 what Jesus says. In John chapter 3, verse 6, he says, That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And we're talking about a spiritual nature now. We're not talking about anything physical here. It's our spirit that the Lord is talking about here. Jesus points out here that the the spiritual nature of this new birth, and and Nicodemus doesn't understand. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, but he comes to Jesus that he might understand something, but he really doesn't understand that Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth at all. Jesus says this is an immediate act. It's it's irreversible. It's an action that, that is carried out in the human heart. It's placed there by God, by His Holy Spirit, and everyone who believes in Christ receives this new birth. But Nicodemus's perspective here was still on earthly things. In fact, in verse 4, Nicodemus says to Jesus, How can a person be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? I mean, here, here's a legitimate question. I mean, he, he's, it's not like he's, he doesn't, you can almost see the expression on his face when you read this. He says, how can a man be born again when he is old? He can't enter into his mother's womb and be born a second time. Can he? That's what's amazing to me in this, in this text is Nicodemus has some belief in who Jesus is. We're going to see that before we finish here tonight. But even his belief is almost seen in this statement right here because he's saying, I know I've seen you do a lot of things, and I know I've heard a lot of things about you, so can you make that possible? That he could go back into his mother's womb and be born all over again? Because he, he isn't with canny, with a question. But see, Nicodemus, at this point, can only relate to our physical birth, our natural birth, where the, when a human baby is born through the action and, and the will of a of a man and a woman. But this new birth that Jesus is trying to explain to him is is something that can only be implemented in in an action that's taken not by the will of man, but by the will of God. And this new birth is this supernatural spiritual act that is performed by the Holy Spirit within the hearts of every man and woman once they come to a belief and put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing we see here is the author of the new birth here is is announced. In verse 3, Jesus answered and he said to him, Verily, verily, I say to thee, or truly, truly, I say to you. Jesus is saying, I'm the one that's going to cause this to happen. The Lord Jesus is, is the giver of spiritual life. He says here, and we see it here throughout Scripture, but in Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In other words, the world is lost. They're without a Savior. Jesus came to give us this new birth, this new spiritual life. He also said in John chapter 10, verse 10, The thief comes only to to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Jesus wasn't talking about our physical life. He wasn't talking about our life here on this earth. Jesus was talking about our eternal life. He said, I have come to give you life. I've come to give you a new birth. That's what Jesus was saying. We read over in John chapter 3, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever believes in Jesus, this new birth is going to happen. You have eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. And again, Jesus says, if you don't have this new birth, you won't even see the kingdom of God, much less live in it. It won't happen. I was reading an article the other day that it's it's something that we don't like to talk about, but it's very true, and we fool ourselves a lot of times, or we just put it out of our minds. I was reading an article where they were talking about people when their how families react to a death in their family. And things that we say, not necessarily just the family, but Christians in general, we just say to try to make people feel better. And one of those phrases is, they're in a lot better place. 
Well, let me just tell you, if they're not, if they haven't had this new spiritual birth, they're not in a better place. And not everyone who dies is in a better place. We say that to make ourselves feel better. We say that to make family members feel better and friends feel better. But if your friends and your family and people you know did not know Jesus Christ, if they just didn't have this new spiritual birth that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about, we're told here in this 36th verse, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Jesus says you have to be born again. We are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christians are the, are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus. What Jesus did on the cross and the Holy Spirit does in us and for him makes it possible for us to become the children of God. He is the author of our salvation. He is the giver of eternal life. The new birth that Jesus is talking about here is only possible because of Jesus. Nothing that we have done at all. Other than being convicted of God, convicted of the Holy Spirit, and receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior. This text also tells us the possibility of the new birth is experienced. Nicodemus was an important person. We read this story about him, and we don't think a whole lot about him. I think a lot of people don't outside this context, but Nicodemus is mentioned somewhere else in Scripture. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But here's Nicodemus. He's a respected Pharisee. He's a knowledgeable teacher. He's a member of the Sanhedrin court. And he comes to Jesus in verse 2, and it says, This man came to Jesus at night. There's a lot of speculation about why he came to Jesus at night. We can, we can sort of make a list of why he may have came. He, he approaches Christ under the cover of darkness. And again, we really don't know why. Did he come after dark because of fear of being seen by some of the other people on the council or some of the Pharisees? Did he not want to be seen talking to Jesus? Was that one? Maybe. Did he come because he thought it would be a more private time? There wouldn't be a lot of folks around and a lot of people begging Jesus for miracles. And he thought, after dark, the crowds will go away, everyone will go home, and so it's going to make it possible for me, Nicodemus, to speak to Jesus without any distractions from a large crowd. We do know that he was interested in Jesus because he, he made this effort to get there. For whatever reason, he came after dark. We don't know, but at least he came. We see that he, he may have even believed what Jesus said. There was something going on in Nicodemus. We don't get the whole story, but he was one of the two who took the body of Jesus down from the cross and prepared him for burial. We read over in John 19, 35 through 42, Joseph of Arimathea there in verse 38, he had already asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. And with Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, a man who, who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a, a mixture of, of myrrh and, and aloes and, and about 75 pounds. And, and taking the body of Jesus, the two of them wrapped it with spices in strips of linen, and then in accordance with the Jewish burial custom, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden there was a new tomb which no one had ever laid in. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and because the tomb was nearby, they lay Jesus' body there. So this man that's questioning Jesus, later on, is the man who's going to help bury Jesus. Now, we're not told in the text whether he came to, to saving faith in Christ, but something changed in his life. Something changed in his life. But Nicodemus, when he comes to Jesus, he has some really sincere questions, I really believe. He wasn't trying to trick Jesus up like the Pharisees always did. 
but he came asking some very legitimate questions. Nicodemus was a devout Pharisee, yes. He was one of the only 70 members of the Sanhedrin Religious Council. He was, he was the, one of the top 70 dogs in the community right here. I mean, he, he would have been a, a highly influential religious person, a political person. He had wealth. Nicodemus, in our day and time, would have been the modern politician, celebrity preacher, and wealthy businessman all rolled into one. That's who Nicodemus was. He had everything going on. I mean, he, he, he had it all. But he didn't have a Savior until he comes to Jesus. Now, their conversation as Jesus and Nicodemus talk involves Jesus talking and taking some of the wind out of Nicodemus' sails, really. Nicodemus recognizes that Jesus' miracles and proofs of his divine mission, and, and yet he struggles with Jesus' description of this spiritual birth. I mean, he comes to him, he calls him rabbi. Now, we have to understand that was a, that was a courtesy because people also called Nicodemus rabbi. So when Nicodemus first comes to Jesus, did he see him and Jesus sort of on level playing field? I don't know. But he does come out of respect, and he starts asking him some questions. But, but Christ explains to, Jesus, to, to Nicodemus real fast that, that you have to be born again, born from above. A person has to express a, a saving faith in Christ in order to be saved. That's what he's telling Nicodemus. And then Jesus sort of teases Nicodemus a little bit here when you read this text because he says, saying, he calls him teacher of Israel. Like, teacher of Israel, you ought to know these things. You are the, you are the politically strong person. You're the religious, uh, one of the top 70 guys. You know, that's you. you, you are, you're wealthy. You're a man who claims to have all these accolades in his life. You should know these things, that you must be born again. You should know them. Christ also points out here that those who resist this mundane idea about God will never accept the deeper spiritual things. Years ago, I mean years ago, this has been 20 years ago, I had this ongoing conversation with this, with this man about having to be born again. And he just couldn't get past that. He could almost believe Christ dying on the cross, he, he was right there with that. And he, he, could, he could get a grasp on the resurrection. But he just couldn't understand why you had to be born again. He couldn't get that. Wrestled with it, wrestled with it, and he, he just couldn't get it. And that's what this text is telling you. If you can't get that, you can't get the rest of it. This is the first part right here. You're never going to understand the deeper truths of God until you understand this simple truth that a man must be born again, must be born from above. As Nicodemus comes to Jesus, you notice here in the text right away, Jesus doesn't even really let him get his first statement out, his first question out, the reason why he had come, what was going on, what he wanted to know, until Jesus just answers him and said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus cuts to the, cuts to the point, cuts to the quick right here. Just, okay, before you start with all this clutter, before you start with all of this stuff, let me tell you, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. So what's that mean for us? I mean, we're trying to witness to our friends. We're trying to witness to the people that we know. We're trying to witness to people in the community. Uh, we're, we're trying to share the, the gospel message with people. What does that mean to us? Or maybe you're listening tonight here, or maybe you're watching us online, and you're, just, you're not a Christian. You just don't know. You're, you're trying to get past this, get your, get, your, get your mind around this concept as well. And what Jesus is saying right here is very simple. We are all, we're all lost. We're all sinners. Go ahead and start reading the rest of, of, of John chapter 3. Because we know 3.16 real well. 
A lot of people can't tell you 17, but they can tell you 16. But Jesus says that we're, that we're all sinners. We're all lost is what we know from this conversation here. Jesus says you must be born again. You must have this new spiritual birth, this birth from above. It has to happen. And the way it happens is when you get down to John chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Nicodemus was talking to the giver of this new birth, this new life. He was talking directly to Jesus. And the good news for us tonight is we can talk directly to him as well. Maybe these are some of the questions you have. How, how can a man be born again when he's already old? How can he be born from his mother a second time. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not talking about a physical birth. He's talking about a spiritual birth. And he says that everyone who is born of the Spirit will be spirit. In other words, whoever believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, at that time of you believing in Christ, what he has done on the cross for you, how he came from the grave on the third day, how he, how he died for your sin. Once we believe that, we admit and confess that we are sinners and receive Jesus into our life. Jesus says at that time, immediately, right then, the new birth occurs. That you're a child of God. And at that time, with this new birth now, life is yours. Eternal life that he talks about throughout Scripture is yours. And we have this if we'll simply give our hearts and our lives to Jesus. That is it. It's not anything that we do. It's not the good works that we do. It's not the generosity that we may have. It's not that you preach in a pulpit. It's not that you sing in a choir or teach a Sunday school class. It's all simply about giving your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus. And then at that time, the new birth occurs. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight for your gift, the gift of salvation. And that gift of salvation comes only through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you and we praise him tonight for his death on the cross, uh, for his victory over the grave, and the precious gift that he gives to each and every one who would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. Father, tonight we thank you for the new birth and what it means in our lives as believers tonight. And I pray for anyone who may be listening tonight to us uh, as we worship together as a church. Lord, tonight that they themselves would experience that new birth. They would ask Christ to simply forgive them of the sin that they know they have in their life. They would ask him to take that sin and forgive them. They believe upon the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that they would start anew at that moment. So Father, thank you tonight for this gift. Thank you for the new life that we have and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.